So Dhruva Maharaj feels that I let myself be driven by trivial desires, which were unworthy of me. I saw the Lord, but I did not. Uh, I approached Him for such a petty thing as a kingdom. So the theme I thought we'll discuss today is about how do we as devotees look at our past. Dhruva Maharaj is at this point looking back at his past and contemplating how he came here. And at one level, he is regretting where he was in the past. So in one sense, that's an understandable emotion. In another sense, we look at what it implies. So when we will look at the past, broadly speaking, so basically this will be the overall theme because we all have a past in our lives. And when we come to Krishna Bhakti also, the past remains. So, I hope the PowerPoint is clear. At any time, if the audio or the video is not clear, let me know. Mm -hmm. So, when we look at the past, we one way we may look at it, it's just a waste of time. I was wasting my human birth before I came to Krishna Bhakti. Uh, that we had best, if only I could have avoided it, if I had come to Bhakti in my childhood, if I had been born in a devotee's family, it would have been, it would have been so nice. And in one sense, that's true. However, we can't change the past. And another, more health, so this is a good way of looking at past because ultimately we want to attain Krishna and every moment that is disconnected from Krishna, that is distracted from Krishna, that is just prolonging our existence in this world. So that's one good way of looking at the past, but this is definitely better than hankering for the past and thinking maybe my life in the past was better. I was happier, I was enjoying life more, which is rarely true, but our mind can make us imagine anything. However, a healthier way to look at the past is to see that our past was a mix of good and bad. And that prepared us for coming to Krishna. So Krishna works in our life irrespective of whether we are working toward him or not. So for, from our perspective, our coming to Krishna consciousness can seem like a dramatic change in our life. So maybe our life was going in one direction and suddenly it starts going in another direction, sometimes an, sometimes an entirely opposite direction. Uh, while that is true from our perspective, and it's important to recognize that perspective, but from Krishna's perspective, actually, he was always acting in our life. So even when we are going somewhere off track, Krishna was still in our hearts. Ishvara sarva bhutanam, rudeshe arjuna tishthati, brahmayan sarva bhutani, yantra rudhani mayaya, Krishna says, I am guiding the wanderings of all living beings. And it doesn't say at this time, Bhaktanam. He says, Sarva Bhutanam. All living beings, I am, I am direct, I am uh, guiding their wanderings. So that means Krishna is acting in our lives, whether we are turning toward him or turning away from him. So one aspect of a Krishna conscious vision, one way we say that, Sorry. So one way, a Krishna conscious look at the past, we can say. Um, we may say that I was just wasting my time in the past, which is one way of looking at it. But how was Krishna acting in my life when I was unaware of him, when I was forgetful of him? Because he was acting even then. And understanding this actually can help us spiritualize our vision uh, of our past. And it is not just an uh, ideal, look, idle, idle look at the past. It is, it is, if we are going to look at everything through Krishna conscious perspective, a devotee tries to see uh, every, everything as related with Krishna. So even when we come to, when we see, when we interact with people who are not yet familiar with Krishna consciousness. So those who are not KC, those who are not yet Krishna conscious, we see 
what spiritual potential they have so why not then why not see what spiritual potential our pre kc self had before we came to krishna conscious what was what was our consciousness what was our nature so to see everything in krishna consciousness means to even look at our past from a krishna conscious perspective now dhruv maharaj does say that i approach the lord for such a petty desire but that is his realization and that 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 is an appreciation in one sense if you want to put it this way that dhruv maharaj's expression is a is a declaration of how extraordinary the higher taste of beholding krishna and loving krishna is so while he laments about his past the lord does not undermine or dismiss his past the lord tells him go back to your kingdom and rule the kingdom and when he goes back to the kingdom he is not dismissive towards his relatives he is not dismissive to any of them so in that sense we can see this uh you can say something like dhruv maharaj look at the past it is not a condemnation of the past of his past and his past of course was exalted he was born in a ex- exalted family he had a very devoted mother but of even his past motives but a proclamation of the glory of the higher taste so sometimes what happens is we take contextual statements and we absolutize them then what happens is we think oh everything in my past was simply a waste well not entirely mm-hmm. so another reason one reason why we can we need to look at our past is because if we are krishna conscious about everything why not have a krishna, if we want to see krishna everywhere see krishna in our past also but another important reason is we are informed by the past by informed means the word information nowadays refers only to data but inform so inform means we are formed internally so our inner world is formed by our past and we bring that into a krishna consciousness and here dhruv maharaj is lamenting the fact that he had unworthy desires from the past and yes that that is something which uh, at one level is not the highest motive to approach krishna of course krishna says even such people are sukritna those who approach him for for wealth they are also pious people they are good souls krishna says in 716 in the bhagavad gita but still that is not the highest desire so we can say that okay we also came maybe we came only for prasad we came because we have just frustrated with life in kaliyuga krishna talks about four categories of people who come to him in kaliyuga there are also four categories of people who come to krishna and those four categories are those who are distressed those who are distressed those who are distressed and those who are distressed <laughs> everybody is distressed in some way or the other maybe some relationship problem maybe some financial break breakdown maybe some psychological meltdown whatever it is maybe some existential emptiness but they're distressed so we come because of whatever reason we may come for relief from distress but what happens is we may say okay i had those desires and i abandoned those desires now so my past doesn't have any bearing on me but actually our past didn't just give us those desires that we abandoned you know our past also gave us our attitudes our world view our values and those don't change so quickly mm-hmm. so with respect to say attitudes could say some people by by nature are more optimistic some people are more pessimistic and that's how they will be it's not that that is going to change magically because they come to come to bhakti just like we know there are four varanas in the vedic vedic standard and it is not that just because a kshatriya comes to bhakti the kshatriya will suddenly become a brahmana so we could say our values in terms of our core values of our psychophysical nature they remain the same so understanding where we are we have come from helps us understand what we are carrying now what we are carrying is not just a burden that we have to give up 
So, <clears throat> so we can say when we say we informed by a past, what we are carrying from our past, it's at one level. If you can say it's not just a burden, we need to shed. Yes, that's there. So, for example, impure desires, but it's also our resource for moving ahead toward Krishna. Our past is pro past has made us who we are. So, our interests, abilities, <clears throat> we could say even nature, psychophysical natures. Those are our resources by which we are moving toward Krishna. And in that sense, uh, it is not just a burden we, we have to abandon. It's our resource. So understanding what resources we have, uh, that's very important for us to move ahead in our life. So at some level, we easily understand it. Say if some new person comes in and then we ask, what do you do? We understand what their abilities are. And then we may engage them in service accordingly. But that's at a, at a gross level. But at a deeper level, there's some people are more of an introvert nature. Some people are of an extrovert nature. And then understanding that is important to decide what kind of services they can do the best. So it is for guiding others. It is also for guiding ourselves. Because in general, when we are introduced initially, we are just told to surrender and obey. And we do whatever services we are told to do. And that's important to learn as a matter of submission and discipline. But over a period of time, if we are to serve Krishna sustainably, then we have to understand our nature and we can best serve accordingly. So what we are carrying from our past is not is also our resource for moving toward the future. And that's why understanding, looking at our past in a holistic way is important. Now I mentioned about the values that we bring from the past. So here we can say our values are broadly of two different kinds. There are foundational values and there are functional values. So by foundational values, what I mean is our understanding of our identity and our destiny. So who we are and what we are meant to achieve in our life. And functional values refers to how we operate and conduct ourselves in life. By operate means it's our body to some extent like a machine and in some ways it functions on its own even without our realizing it. Whereas conduct refers to where we are conscious and we try to conduct ourselves in a particular way. So we could say by the practice of, so to understand these foundational and functional values, let's look at a metaphor. So if you're driving a car, while car driving, normally we talk about the car metaphor as we are not the body, we are the soul. And uh, so we are not the car, we are the driver of the car. So yes, even when our understanding shifts that I am not the car, I'm the driver of the car. But still, I am still I am stuck with the same car I had earlier. So what will change after I understand my identity is my understanding of my destination, my destiny. Once I understand that, okay, I'm not the body, I'm the car. That means I'll understand that, okay, my purpose is not just to gratify the body, but it is to use the body for realizing myself spiritually for reaching Krishna. So the, when we understand that I'm not the body and the uh, uh, soul, what happens is our understanding of our identity and our destiny changes. That's how our foundational value changes. But our functional values don't change how we are driving. How we are driving means we may learn to become better drivers, but uh, we still have the same car. So we still have the same body. Suppose a person came to know that they are going completely on the wrong track. And then they, okay, I have to go this way. They change the course and they start driving in a new path. Now, does that mean automatically just because they are going in the right destination, suddenly their driving skills are going to change drastically? No, their driving skills more or less are going to be the same. So similarly for us, at some level, our functional values don't change substantially. Our functional values, to some extent, remain how they are. And that is one reason why when different devotees start practicing bhakti, they all have 
to some extent somewhat different conceptions of what is important in bhakti also if somebody grew up in a family which was very rigid and disciplined very very disciplinarian kind of family then they will say so let's put it this way now so how our past shapes our present bhakti hmm? if you want to look at that so we may be practicing bhakti we may be teaching bhakti so if somebody had a rigid disciplined upbearing upbringing and that helped them to grow that helped them to succeed in their lives in whatever to whatever extent they succeeded so they may feel so they may gravitate towards those of prabhupad's teachings which focus on discipline on obedience so we will gravitate toward a uh, discipline aspect of krishna consciousness so recently i was talking with one prominent uh, leader in our yatra and uh, i was asking him we had a monks podcast but before that we were discussing informally i asked him which is the which is the most relevant section of prabhupad's books that you find and he said 3.30 per port in the bhagavad gita so 3.30 is prabhupad says that we all should function like spiritual life is like functioning in military discipline that now okay that's very interesting i thought that it is not about community it is not about belonging it is about military discipline that we have to obey and we have to function like a military we are fighting a war against illusion and that's true but this is a war which you have to fight life long even the best of soldiers if they are in war mode for a long time they just break down completely so in one sense a war is one at metaphor of our life so i uh, when i talked about talked with him in the a little bit more and so that was the kind of upbringing he had and that's what he was inspired by so on the other hand if somebody ha- came from a from a say a good loving community or family then what will happen is maybe that's what they will seek to cultivate so they will gravitate toward teachings that a step further that that further a similar similar ethos in bhakti so what will happen is that somebody may be coming from a good loving family or community or somebody may value that a lot because maybe they didn't have it and they long for it which your way it is so what happens is uh, when we are practicing krishna bhakti and sharing krishna bhakti we may think that actually i am i am i am teaching the spirituality this is krishna consciousness but we have got one perspective of krishna consciousness and our perspective of krishna consciousness is largely shaped by our past far more than what we usually understand and appreciating this is Uh, is not to say that we are not krishna conscious yes we are krishna conscious but maybe our way of krishna being krishna conscious is not the only way of being krishna conscious and for those who have come from a significantly different past the the way they can best practice bhakti may be significantly different so uh, this is with respect to uh, the way we we treat each other, the way we train others the way we expect ourselves to be this can vary based on that one more important point i would like to talk over here is with respect to humility and self pity now when we practice bhakti what happens is that humility is emphasized as a very important value and no doubt it is here dhru dhru maharaj is not being proud just see i performed austerity for a few months and the lord himself came in front of me for darshan so it's amazing dhru maharaj's humility over here so actually we can say dhru maharaj had reason to be proud so we can say dhru mahar uh, dhru maharaj's devotional disposition devotion uh, his devotion is such that he is a devotee doesn't focus on what i have achieved not proud that he had darshan of the lord at such a young age in 
such a short time of austerity so his austerity was so intense it is by every means laudable what he was able to do hmm? small children are not really very disciplined so for dhruva maharaj to not only have the courage to go to the forest but after that to perform rigorous austerity so, sometimes when we use the when we think about dhruva maharaj we may forget at this point that he's just a 5 year old boy so for a 5 year old boy to have so much courage and discipline that's extraordinary so and not only did he have courage and discipline but with that courage and discipline he was hugely successful so but he is not at all proud his courage and discipline are laudable uh, but he, he is humble and a humble he is saying i came with such a petty motive so in one sense a devotee we could say this that a devotee is find reasons to be humble and ordinarily we find reasons to be proud we find reasons to say oh i did so much great things i done this and i have done that you know, one of my friends was doing a marketing course he did his masters in marketing and it, they told you know how you should market yourself so they were taught that how to write your cv how to promote yourself they said if you are going along a road and you see a tap that is open and it is dripping some drops of water and you you go and turn off that tap then you can add in your cv i am a water conservation activist <laughs> so in material life people often find reasons to be proud but a devotee finds reasons to be humble so <clears throat> if we have if we have achieved a lot of lot of success in our life even in our bhakti you know if suppose a devotee has distributed lots of books uh, and then say i distributed so many books a devotee can say or he can say you know actually if i had if i had more purity if i had more dedication i could have done so much more for krishna so a devotee so it's it's the humility of a devotee that devotees find reasons to be humble and that is laudable no doubt at the same time it's important to understand that humility is different from self pity self pity means we start feeling sorry for ourselves if we start feeling sorry for ourselves and our past oh my past was so terrible and because of which i am also so terrible now then that is not healthy so spirituality is not meant to lead us to negativity where you know i have this conditioning from my past and it doesn't require condemning or rejecting our past as negative actually spirituality is about builds on the past positive aspect of our past say for a, we may have learned some languages which we can in which you can speak about krishna and share about krishna with other we may have learned some skills we may have learned some vocations so our spirituality builds builds on our past so if we don't understand this aspect of our spirituality so when does spirituality lead us to self pity Uh, when we think that spirituality is a state you know oh if i am constantly remembering krishna i am spiritual but when we see it as a state that is unattainable unattainable for us it's so far away from me i have so many conditions then we wallow in self pity however self pity is not at all healthy for bhakti because what is happening in self pity the self is very prominent oh i am so unworthy i am so fallen i am so i am good for nothing so how is self pity different from humility no humility humility is very easily misunderstood but if you look at the essence of humility it is it is not about devaluing ourselves you know i had such petty desires i have this past and that but it is about valuing something bigger than ourselves that there is krishna and the service to krishna that is far bigger than me and now i have the opportunity to serve krishna so let me focus on serving krishna let me try to do everything that i can in krishna's service so self pity focuses on devaluing and de- 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 denigrating our past now of course there there are things of our from our past that are lamentable and what to speak of from our past even our present there may be things that are lamentable the things which we want to we would much rather be without but 
a devotee's focus is on Krishna. Ultimately, we want to be Krishna conscious. Like Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, Trunadapi suniche na. But what is the purpose of Trunadapi suniche na? It is not just to be humbler than a plate of grass. It is so that we can glorify Krishna constantly. Trunadapi suniche na, tarorapi sahishna na. Amani na amani na, kirtaniya sadahari. So kirtaniya sadahari doesn't just literally mean chanting the holy names 24 hours. It can mean that Kirtaniya Sadahari also means that our heart is focused on glorifying Krishna. Not on worrying how good or how bad we are. Kirtaniya Sadahari. So always glorifying Krishna. So a devotee is constantly looking for opportunities. How can I glorify Krishna in this situation? So if you are thinking how good we are, that is usually ego. If you think how bad we are, that is low self-esteem. That is pity, self-pity. What we want in our spiritual life is to focus on Krishna. So we will see that although Dhruva Maharaj here has this mood wherein he feels that uh, I was so, I had such trivial desires by which I came to Krishna. Uh, I, I came to the Lord, but he doesn't condemn him, he doesn't condemn himself entirely. He goes back and takes up the responsibility of ruling the world as per the Lord's will. And that means he values his, the service that the Lord wants him to do and he does that wholeheartedly. Sometimes, you know, we meet some devotees and they may say, you know, I am so fallen, I am so this, I am so that. Okay, now that may be a, that may be an expression of humility, but what next after that? How long can we have that same like a like a, a record that keeps playing again and again the same thing? Okay, what what can we do for Krishna together? However we are, how what can we do for Krishna? So there are times when definitely we need to express humility, but ultimately humility doesn't mean self pity. So let's look at the difference between the two. So I am not worth obsessing on constantly. That means, you know, I am not so important that I have to keep thinking of myself constantly. Hmm? There is something bigger than me that is important. So that is, so humility is not devaluing myself. It is not condemning oneself, but it is understanding that there is something bigger than myself, which is, which is what I want to focus on. Where self-pity is, I am worthless. And then you can look at the second point and the third point, I'll come to the second point afterward, that my worth is best realized when I focus on the reality bigger than myself, those who are truly humble are actually also quite purposeful, quite determined because they have something worthwhile to work on. They have, they're working on, they're devoted to some cause. Prabhupada was humble, but Prabhupada also determined because he was determined to serve Krishna. Bhakti Nath Thakur wrote so many songs expressing heartbreaking humility. At the same time, Bhakti Nath Thakur wrote books of profound scholarship. A, pro, a deep erudition in which he addressed and countered some of the uh, many many deviant philosophies, and he pointed out the objection, pointed out the pro limitations with various philosophies, even by prominent philosophers. So he his humility did not lead him to self pity or oh, I am worthless. No, he he knew that if I am serving Krishna and I am delivering Krishna's message, then I want to do something worthwhile. Let me do it well. But self-pity means that if we are too centered on ourselves, then we think of a cause. Even if we think of a cause bigger than ourselves, we think, okay, that's so big, what can I do about it? And then anything bigger than ourselves, what it, it simply increases our feeling of worthlessness. And that brings us to the core difference between humility and self-pity. Humility is, it's founded in self-acceptance. And we could say, and... and it fructifies toward self-transcendence. Self-transcendence means that a devotee, by becoming absorbed in Krishna, transcends oneself. The, Chet, the Bhagavatam says that how evam ratah so evam ratah swapriya, that when a devotee becomes absorbed in glorifying the Lord, then the loka bahaya, the devotee becomes so absorbed in singing about the Lord's glory that the devotee is not even aware of oneself. So in that sense, the devotee transcends oneself. When Chaitanya Mahaprabhu would be dancing in front of Jagannath, he would not even be aware of where he was. 
so his body would get remarkable transformations he would be talking with someone at one time uh, talking with the devotee and suddenly next one would disappear because he would see krishna somewhere behind a tree playing his flute or calling him and he would just run there there is self transcendence so there is self transcendence so if we uh, but in self pity it is founded in self condemnation or self rejection i am worthless and yes we may have some desires that are worthless but that doesn't make us worthless you know there is misidentification ha <clears throat> fallacy what do you mean misidentification fallacy so we we may initially think i am the body and then after that i may think i am not the body but saying i am not the body doesn't lead to anything positive i am still focused on an illusion what is the illusion the illusion is that okay i am not this but what i am that is important so if i think i am the body that's an illusion but if my focus is not that i am on a soul i am a soul i am a part of krishna i focus i am not the body i am not the body i am not the body no we are still focused on something which is uh, which is uh, we could say to some extent uh, unhealthy so the, the in bhakti we could say the focus of a devotee is primarily in on serving krishna so and now to some extent in our culture in our world today identification of the body is very strong and that's why shri prabhupad strongly emphasized not identifying with our body and that is no doubt important but still that is not the only thing that is important um because after all we may say i am not the body but what are we is more important and what we are essentially is souls so to think i am not the body alone is not enough so we can say there are the paths of karma jnana and bhakti so if we consider our self identity to think i am the body is karma to think i am not the body is largely jnana because it's a intellectual contemplation i am not the body but bhakti is i and my body are both meant for krishna so among all the resources that we have our body you can say is the most fundamental resource and we are meant to use that in for serving krishna and if we don't use it for krishna then what are we doing so then we are not really growing in our spiritual life properly we are not using all that we have in krishna's service so understanding this so, so this why am i talking about this at this stage the point i'm making here is that for each one of us oh the screen is not getting shared i didn't realize that sorry okay so if i consider my self identity to think i am the body that is karma that is the path of material misidentification illusion but to think i am not the body that is na iti na iti we know not this not this not this that is primarily the path of jnana so now to that that has some utility but our focus is not on rejecting our body it is on engaging our body in bhakti so i am meant for krishna and everything that i have is meant for krishna my body is also meant for krishna so why are we talking about our body our body is the place where our functional values are located our body is the place where our our attitudes our natures are located so all of it is meant for serving krishna so self rejection is more self rejection in a mundane sense will simply lead us to depression but even if we are thinking we can bring it on the spiritual side of our life in our spirituality that kind of self rejection will only lead us to uh, more of a depersonalized or impersonal kind of spirituality if somebody is sick and is in pain 
Now that is a time when we should be doing some Vaishnava seva and offering them some help if we can. But if we tell them somebody is sick and in pain, you are not the body. We'll be very impersonal at that time. And unfortunately, many devotees, by misunderstanding or misapplying the philosophy, have become like that. So just as we can become impersonal about others, we can even become impersonal about ourselves. Now, what does it mean to say impersonal about ourselves? Mm. So, uh, we could say that mm, impersonalism actually can come in many forms in a devotee's life. So, when we say somebody is being impersonal, that means they are not treating the other somebody, somebody as a person. So, we are treating them somebody, somebody like a just like a robot or an instrument or something like that. So, if we are impersonal about ourselves, what does it mean? We we don't uh, we don't value the parts of us that krishna has given us for serving him so for example if our body or our mind are disturbed by something then to just dismiss it oh this is just mundane this is just the body this is the uh, this is just uh, this is just i'm not all these things well you are not all these things that's true but just as there can be impersonalism in dealing with others there can be impersonalism in dealing with ourselves also and if we are like that what happens is we become very cold and hard hearted and we may be very strict in practicing our bhakti but that strictness will not strictness in bhakti in practicing bhakti may not necessarily lead to softness of heart that is the essence of bhakti now i'm not saying here we be sentimental that's not the point at all the point is that so we may get um, we may get but no softness of heart we might not get the softness of heart so softness of heart comes if somebody is in trouble we can't say i care for your soul and i don't care for your body we care for the whole being we care for the complete person so looking at our past in a holistic way is what enables us to function properly in our life today and because our present resources our body and mind have been affected by our past now we don't want to wallow in our past oh you know this person did this to me in the past and that person did that to me and that person did that to me and we don't want to simply be telling everyone our autobiography that is, we don't want to tell we want to get into like a pity party where we are simply telling everyone about all the things that bad things that have happened to us but the point is acknowledging our past holistically helps us see where we are and that helps us chart a path ahead if we have too bleak a view of our past then that can very easily become a recipe for us to sink into self pity because then we'll feel oh my past was so terrible so what hope do i have to practice bhakti well instead of thinking of that way i'll conclude with this point and tomorrow we'll continue this theme but so if my past was so terrible if that's 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 our focus then one way to go with that is that what hope is there for me to practice bhakti so i have so many conditionings and i have this and that what hope is there for me but that's only one way of looking at it another way of looking at it is that even from such a past krishna has picked me up so if krishna help me then why will he not help me now so this is a much more krishna conscious way of looking at our past so this is we could say a self conscious vision of our past oh my past was so terrible so what is the uh, what is the use of me but a krishna conscious vision of our past would be that okay what however terrible my past was krishna picked me up out of it and krishna brought me here so if krishna has brought me this far he didn't bring me this far to to abandon me krishna will see me through this also 
so even if our past conditionings are popping up and are troubling us and we feel oh is my bhakti working also am i still the same person have the changes happened or not we don't have to demean ourselves by that we don't have to discourage ourselves by that yes we need to move ahead in our life and for moving ahead in our life we need to have the the vision that is most conducive so we need to look at what we need as i that the this is a concluding point i mentioned this is the build up of that point itself so if we are feeling complacent you know i have become so pure i am so exalted then we need to look ahead uh, to see how far we still have to go and we definitely have to go a long long way all of us there are so many more levels of devotion to reach and relish so if we feel complacent then we look ahead to see how far we need to go but if you feel diffident if you feel discouraged if you feel uh, feel, uh, feel disheartened then we need to look behind to see to see how how far we have come and all of us have been brought a long distance by krishna from wherever we were and that same krishna who brought us here that krishna will take us all the way to him in future so with this vision of this krishna centered vision of our of our past and our present we can move forward confidently in our spiritual life and dhru maharaj while he laments his past here still he doesn't reject or condemn his past entirely he builds on that past by going back to the kingdom in which he, to, to the fam dynasty in which he was born and taking up responsibilities over there but doing it in a krishna conscious way so i'll summarize i spoke today on the theme of how we can look our, at our past in a krishna conscious way so two ways one could be that oh my past was such a waste of time and if i uh, it i could have avoided it the other is the past prepared me for how i came to krishna and so if we are looking at if we are to look at krishna see krishna in everything uh, and we is like to seek some potential for krishna even in new people or not devotees then why not see how, the potential for krishna in our past see how krishna was acting in our lives even when we were turned away from him and that is one the second reason for looking at our past is that our past is not something we have left entirely there is a part of our past which are many of our unworthy desires which we may have given up or which we are trying to give up there is a burden to shed but our past is also a resource for our present that means our past has formed our world view our attitudes our values and we are using those as our resources for serving krishna so don't our values change after practicing bhakti yes they do they talk about fun fundamental value uh, funda foundational values in terms of who we are and where we are meant to go they change just like if i understand i am not the car i am the driver of the car then my identity changes and then i understand where i want to go my goal is not to pander to the body but is to realize my soul realize the soul but uh, we still have the same car and we still have to drive the same car so our functional values which are associated with the psychophysical nature of our body they don't change and we need to work with them so if we have too negative a view of our past we can very easily descend into self pity where whenever we face problems in our present we start thinking oh my past was so terrible that's why i'm so terribly unequipped to practice bhakti and therefore i am hopeless so self pity is actually not krishna conscious because it is too centered on the self and we talk about difference between self pity and humility humility is not about devaluing ourselves it is about valuing something bigger than ourselves ultimately we through we have trunadapi sunichena so that there can be kirtaniya sadahari so we don't want to be self centered how unworthy i am but how wonderful krishna is that and how can i glorify him constantly so the difference between self pity and humility is that self pity is uh, humility is basically i am not worth constantly thinking about my there are better things to think about self pity is i am worthless and self uh, humility is when i undis my worth is fully manifested fully realized when i devote myself to a cause bigger than myself when i devote myself to krishna a self pity is i am worthless and seeing how great krishna is 
seeing how great the services to Krishna are, anything bigger than myself, that only uh, heightens my sense of worthlessness. So humility is grounded in self-acceptance, whereas self-pity is, gr is grounded in, uh, in self-rejection. And self-rejection is impersonal. We talked about how, because when we focus on I am not the body, that can also be another form of illusion because I'm not really focusing on what I am. So to think I am the body is karma, to think I'm not the body is jnana, but to think that I and my body all are meant to serve Krishna, that is the essence of bhakti. So accepting what we have and utilizing what we have in Krishna's service, that is the healthiest way for us to move ahead in our spiritual life. And uh, for that, it concluded by talking about as devotees, we look, we need to see where we look at for moving ahead in our life. If we feel because of my past, I have so many obstacles in my spiritual life, instead of thinking that way, that despite my past, Krishna picked me up from there. So surely Krishna will take me all the way. So if you feel, if you feel, uh, feel arrogant or complacent, we look ahead to see how far we have to go. If you feel diffident, we look behind to see how far we have come or rather how far Krishna has brought us. And thus we gain the confidence to continue our practice in bhakti. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. So are there any reflections or questions? Uh, I, I, I have a question, uh, Prabhu, but if a senior devotee wants to go first, I can wait. Uh, I don't I don't think anyone else has. Yes, Vijay Krishna Prabhu. Yes, uh, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu, please accept my humble obeisance. All oh, glories to Srila Prabhupada. Prabhu, my question is related to um, um, a quote that I find in the purport that Mother Vrinda recited before you came to the class. Uh, and it goes like this, um, quote, Dhruva Maharaj could understand very uh, clearly that the Lord had offered him the rule of the world for 36,000 years, because in the beginning, he was under the spell of the material energy and wanted to take revenge against his stepmother and rule over his father's kingdom, end quote. So Prabhu, based on this quote, my question is as follows. Um, uh, there is a difference between uh, uh, Dhruva Mah the condition of Dhru Dhruva Maharaj and the devotee that he was and uh, the, 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 the ordinary devotees, the ordinary living entities, the, the position of, of Dhruva Mah Maharaj was very exalted. So, uh, uh, and um, in order to educate uh, Dhruva Maharaj, Krishna gave him uh, a, a kingdom, uh, the, 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 the pole star planet, and 36 thousand years for ruling in order to deal with his revenge, revengeful attitude uh, towards his stepmother and his uh, uh, stepbrother, if I'm not wrong. So mm. my question is, when, when Krishna is dealing with the um, revengeful behavior of ordinary devotees, what, what, what is it that it happens to them? How does uh, Krishna uh, deal uh, deal uh, with, with the revenge, revengeful uh, behavior of an ordinary devotee. Okay. So... Prabhu, uh, 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 is it that I, I'm going to, to achieve also a, 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 a post-star plan, planet or, and 36,000 years okay. of ruling? Uh, I don't think so. That okay, is okay. My That's a good question. So, because Dhru Maharaj approached the Lord with material desires, so he had to, he had to rule. Uh, he got a rule for thirty-six thousand years, uh, and so for us, we also may have had worldly desires in the past. So, does that mean also we will continue in material existence? Say we may get pole star. Uh, well, there are. A foundational principle of bhakti 
is to understand that krishna is our well wisher krishna is our greatest well wisher and in one sense krishna knows what is best for us better than even we do so in general we see that the trajectory that uh, devotees have after they come to krishna or other they get the darshan of krishna that varies from person to person so we see that chitraketu had the darshan of krishna of lord shankarshan but then after that he was cursed by uh, parvati because of a misunderstanding and then he became rutrasur and then as rutrasur he became liberated so now we could say was that like a serious mistake on his part well it was a misunderstanding more than a mistake on the other hand we know bharat maharaj when he got attached to a deer and then he had to go to a deer body before getting another human form and getting liberated that was a mistake so either way the lord never abandons a devotee so now you know there are two different ways of looking at the same situation mm. the one way of the looking at the situation is that the lord uh in one sense by giving the kingdom to druva was punishing him okay this is what you came for this is what you will get but if that were the only way of looking at it so in general if we see shri prabhupada also talks from different perspectives at different times and different acharyas also talk from different perspectives so if you consider prahlad maharaj was also told to rule the kingdom so prahlad had no desire to rule the kingdom at all prahlad he could have got the kingdom just by acting as a obedient son of hiranyakashipu but he defied that and then was the lord punishing him by by telling him to become a king and we could say in one sense prahlad's association was far more terrible because still he he was a he was a king he was a king of still the demons so he he of course uh, spiritualized many of them but still he had bad association over there so the lord kept him in that bad association was the lord punishing him for that by doing that and if yes what was he punishing him for what was prahlad maharaj's fault just being born in a demoniac family well the lord is not not that judgmental and uh, uh, and you could say punitive in his approach so what we what different past times can be seen from different perspectives to teach different lessons so one perspective for understanding a dhruva past time is that you know yena kena prakarena manah krishna niveshet somehow or the other fix the mind on krishna or the as the that is the chetan charita that is the bhakti samad sindhu or as the bhagavatam says is akamah sarva kama va moksha kama udari tivrena bhakti yogena yajita purusham param that whether we have worldly desires or whether we have no desires or whether we have the desire for liberation just devote yourself whole heartedly to krishna so so if somebody comes to krishna even with worldly desires if they are intensely devoted they they are amply rewarded even at the material level they are rewarded and then they are also um, he also did get a spiritual reward he got saw the lord and ultimately he attained the lord he he went back to the kingdom of the lord uh, we know his dhruva's victorious departure from the world he stepped on the foot of death and he went in the in the vaikuntha chariot that had come for him so in that sense dhruva was successful so we we shouldn't focus too much on one perspective alone the perspective is important yes so at one level it is good to if we can if we don't approach the lord with worldly desires but in tomorrow session i am going to talk about dealing with our desires that we can't just wish away the desires we have we have to purify them and purification requires time so overall we can see the bhagavatam's focus is one pointed that bhagavatam is overall spoken to help parikshit maharaj focus his mind on krishna and from that perspective uh, when he has already renounced the world when he has already accepted that he is going to die when he has decided to single pointedly focus on krishna till the moment of his death then from that perspective shukdev goswami helps him so shukdev goswami helps him 
by telling stories that will help him to focus his mind entirely on krishna and even when he is telling stories which could which could be analyzed from multiple perspectives he analyzes those stories and the acharya subsequently analyze those stories from that perspective only so but if you see dhruva story comes in the puranas also and there how wonderful dhruva was that you know, by going to the lord he was he had his desire fulfilled so dhruva's devotion is glorified but the lord's benediction is glorified in terms of the lord providing him worldly desires ful fulfilling his worldly desire so uh, my understanding would be that yes if we have had desires in the past what can we do about them we can't wish them away the whatever was the conditioning from that we got those desires and regarding where we will go in the future we can't uh, the future is very individual and in one sense unpredictable can we take one principle and absolutize it that okay this is how it happened so uh, uh, that okay this is what happened to dhruva maharaj that's what is going to happen to everyone but it, is it like that that uh, there are so many different trajectories which different devotees face in their lives when they depart from the world so uh, k k we are all individuals we have an individual relationship with krishna and krishna individually ha will guide us for ahead in our life so whatever is best for us krishna will do and uh, i feel worrying too much about our future can dishearten us so ultimately as devotees we focus not so much on what the future holds we focus on the one who holds the future krishna holds the past krishna holds the present krishna holds the future and if we hold on to that lord then whatever our future brings krishna will keep us safe and keep krishna will keep bringing us closer to him okay uh, uh chaitanya charan prabhu thank you for your uh, amazing answer uh, hari krishna hari krishna prabhu happy to be of service so there's um one question in the chat and then if there's time i have another question oh okay so while we have certain shortcomings and deficiencies what attitude can we have while working on them so that we don't justify them hmm? when we understand ultimately that pleasing and loving krishna is our goal yes we we want to offer the best that we can for krishna in everything so in that sense if we are having some deficiencies we would like to work on them we would like to overcome them so if somebody is say cooking for krishna and they don't they can't cook very well naturally they will want to learn to cook cook better so that they can they can offer krishna the best that they can same way with whatever service we are doing and it can be in terms of skills but it can also in terms of our our values our motives our behavior in general when we are trying to serve krishna so having said that Uh, there is, uh, there is at one level the aspiration of wanting to be the best that we can do and the best we can be. At the same time, the reality is that we are all limited beings. We are all fallible beings, and we are also, you know, we are finite. We are fallible, and then we are also flawed. Not only can we commit mistakes, we are fallible, but we are flawed in the sense that. there are there are things which are conditioning which which uh, make us uh, make us uh, flawed so what do we do we definitely try to learn from our experiences learn from our observations learn from our association so when we commit mistake if we commit if we are doing something wrong or if we have some unhealthy habit then the best way to analyze whether we are justifying it or we are accepting it in terms of okay this is not going to change so quickly so let me live with it is usually two ways actually uh, this is a topic i'm going to talk tomorrow more that one is introspection and the other is association 
it is through introspection we can understand when we take time out just in the heat of the moment what we did we may just beat ourselves why did i do that or we may say this is just the way i am we may defend ourselves but after some time when we introspect then we can see okay you know okay this is something maybe i could have done something better and we if we have some trustworthy friend some some mentor some guides then they can also tell us so basically some parts of us are are maybe undesirable but they may not be so easy to change so we need to accept them some parts we can change and maybe we are just being lazy to change them that's why in some ways both introspection and association actually act like a mirror for us so for example if i have a mirror now if my face is in a particular way and nose a particular way i can't change that but if my tilak is twisted or my other something else in my face is not good i can change that so a mirror not only helps us to see ourselves a mirror also helps us to see what part of us is changeable and what part of us is not changeable so so introspection association can act as mirrors by which we can understand which part of us we accept not that we justify but you know we all also have to choose our battles now if we want if we sit down probably especially if our hypercrit our hypercritical mind is active we can in 5 minutes write down 50 things that are wrong with us but if we start working on all those 50 things simultaneously and we keep being conscious of those things then we will get so so burdened so overwhelmed that we will get crushed so we may decide you know okay there are many things i need to work on or that i can work on but these are the most important things for me so these are what i am working on right now so for example if i decide you know i am going to complete my rounds every day in the morning and i am going to study bhagavatam every day and i am never going to say any no to any service because i want to have vishnu seva and i am going to be responsible in my family and i am going to be the best that i can be for krishna in my job well all these are good for devotees to do but if we try to do all of these simultaneously uh, we may be overwhelming ourselves of course we have to do all of them at some basic level but if you want to improve okay if i decide i want to focus on my japa i want to do that in the mornings okay then i may have to say no to some late night engagements and that may be mean saying no to some devotees also so in one sense first of all so i am making a second point now that sometimes some things may just be too difficult for us to change they may be unchangeable also and sometimes even if some things are changeable at what cost sometimes in trying to change those things we may exert so much effort and other aspects of us which are more easily changeable and more valuable for us to change more important for us to change they may get overlooked that's why having an introspective having a mirror to gain better self understanding is helpful to know when we are when what we are doing is is it self justification or is it self acceptance okay thank you very much thank you tulsi wala prabhu for the thoughtful question yes do we have time now that you said you had a question um i have time i guess anyone that needs to drop off can um actually you 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 already answered it but i was just thinking about like basically in your presentation it's relating to um conscious living one of the principles of conscious living is choosing what one has and so the points that you're making were first actually looking at what we have um as our person our whole person and then and then actually accepting it and then from accepting it then we choose to intentionally use utilize it in service but it seems like at each one of those steps we can get uh blocked or stuck like we can just decide that we don't want to ex- look at all but who we are what we have and one of the biggest challenges i see is that people uh we don't even we don't want to accept it so we can get really stuck on accepting that we have certain a certain lot that we have to deal with you know like constant wasting time with constantly um being disappointed with the car that we have to drive to our destination you know focusing on what we can't change so that that was really what my question was about and i think you answered it and it sounds like you may be addressing it tomorrow too Yeah, let's keep that for tomorrow. If the question is not asked at that time, then you can ask it. Is it okay? So, thank you very much.
ग्रंथराज श्रीमद भागवतम की जाए श्री प्रभु गौर भक्त बिंद की जाए जाए गौर प्रभा